Hello, I'm Lister Velt Middleton. We are very glad to have you with us. At the beginning of this century, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois predicted that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And color, the glorification of one and denigration of another or others, continues to play a dominant role in determining how power is distributed. But what are the tools that have been used and are being used to maintain black-white power relationships? And how are words and images being used to control thought and action among people of African descent in the United States and around the globe? When and how does an African become a Negro? How was the myth of white superiority created in the modern world, and how was it projected back in time? So-called Western education for black children, poison or medicine, the origins of humanity, the beginnings of civilization, royal African images in ancient Egypt, and Africa's gift to Europe. Just some of the topics we'll explore with Dr. Asa G. Hilliard III, the Fuller E. Calloway Professor of Urban Education at Georgia State University. Dr. Hilliard is the former dean of the School of Education at San Francisco State University. A highly respected educational psychologist, Dr. Hilliard was involved with the court case that outlawed IQ testing for black children in California. Dr. Hilliard recovered with Julian Richardson, George G.M. James' seminal work, Stolen Legacy, the African Origin of Greek Philosophy. Dr. Hilliard, what does it mean to be black in America from a psycho-historical perspective? It's important uh, from, for blacks in America to know history. Uh, that history includes the history of enslavement in Africa, of colonization, later of segregation in the United States. Uh, my own studies uh, as a psychologist of the uses of history have shown that uh, this enslavement had uh, more than one part to it. There was a the physical enslavement, but the only way that physical enslavement would work is that the mind also had to be enslaved. And there were a series of, of processes that I call the dynamics of domination. Uh, these uh, processes uh, go something like this, that in order for one group of people, in this case Europeans, to uh, control an African population, it was necessary first to erase African memory, secondly to suppress the practice of African culture, third to teach white supremacy, fourth, to uh, uh, control the institution of socialization to prevent African people from educating their own children, from sending their own messages and so forth through media and what have you, uh, the control of wealth, and finally, physical segregation. Uh, these, were, these are the historical activities mm -hmm that Europeans engaged in in order to conquer the continent, to enslave people, to practice segregation. And of course, if you look closely at that list, you'll notice that the first few things on the list are really psychological. Uh, for example, to destroy memory or to suppress or erase memory is a psychological operation which disables anyone as an individual, an individual who had no memory. Now, when you say memory, you're talking about personal memory or what? I mean the memory of one's group history in okay. particular. Uh -huh. uh, personal memory would be important if we're talking about your own psychological individual adaptation. But you can use the same thinking to apply to a group. When a group loses its historical memory, it is disabled as a result. So these were some of the uh, very calculated and conscious tactics that were applied that resulted in the disabling of the African population. So history, identity, uh, the uh, teaching of belief in white supremacy, each of these is a psychological process that was practiced. And we need to understand that uh, in part by going back and examining the historical record. And having understood it, it's possible to gain control over those things that control us. What do you mean by de-Africanization? And how did that process work? Well, of course, that leads right out of uh, what we were just talking about, that the um, erasing of memory, uh, the teaching of white supremacy, and so forth, 
can place an African population in a position where it begins to reject its own image of itself, its own memory of itself, its own history, uh, becomes less African in, in conscious behavior, although it's very hard to become, if you're truly of African origin, it's very hard for that behavior to disappear. But it's easier for the consciousness of that behavior to disappear. And so over a period of time, you know, figure the uh, centuries that African populations have been in America, it's possible uh, that the population merely American, uh, each of these is a, st a step or an indication that there is some loss of conscious contact with one's true identity. You have talked about the neuroses, I guess that's the word maybe, among the European population. Um, during this enslaving period. Would you address that, please? Right. Well, in, if you operate a system of domination, a formal system of domination, by those rules that I talk about, you have to confront the truth. And, and the only way that you can be consistent in applying those rules is ultimately to bend the truth. And after a while, it results in an, an adaptive process that, I've, that we call racism, which is a is really uh, a mental disorder. Uh, it's a disorder uh, in the mental sense because it follows the rules of mental disorder. For example, manifestations of racist behavior as a result of domination are uh, the denial of reality, uh, perceptual distortion, delusions of grandeur, phobias, in the face of differences and projecting blame, you know, blaming the victim. Now explain so these, those, please. Well, each of these are, are ways that uh, I guess you call them adjustment or adaptive mechanisms. Uh, for example, if you, uh, if you take um, uh, Africa as it really existed and uh, you attempt to subjugate Africa as Europeans did, it couldn't work if you're subjugating another human being. So that human being had to be changed mentally into something else. It had to be changed into a subhuman or an animal or anything else. But it, you could not operate and be consistent with yourself. So it required a change in one's mind, uh, which meant that the Europeans had to begin to lie to themselves about what Africa was and had been. And, and in the process of keeping that misinformation going, then one adapts to unreality. So when you see reality, it's necessary to deny reality. So denial of reality would be an, an example of that, would be to look at uh, the population of Egypt, which was a black population, and to say it was a white population. That's a flat-out denial of what the facts say. And that, of course, has been uh, typical throughout history. Um, uh, perceptual distortion is just simply not getting a clear view of what, of what is really true, even while looking at the truth. Um, teaching of white supremacy means the belief in the supremacy of white people, or it could be anyone who would follow the rules of oppression. If one decided that their own group was superior to all other groups, that would be an example of, um, of uh, what I call a Napoleonic complex, because it is not true that the, the white group is superior to anyone else, but the belief in that would be a psychological uh, distortion of, of, of reality and in that sense would be um, um, would be following the rules for oppression. Okay. As we get ready to go to the first slide, mm -hmm. you've said that racism is a mental disorder. Yes. I was interviewing a gentleman the other day and I, I uh, brought that up in a conversation mm -hmm. and he said, well, racism is not a mental disorder. He said, racism is very ordered. He mm -hmm. said that whites, Europeans, know exactly what they're doing, that uh, racism is a political and economic convenience. How do, how do you respond to that? Well, I think it depends on who you're talking about. If you uh -huh. talk about the, see, I think of systems as having designers, as having advocates, as having players, and as having pawns. Mm -hmm. This is from game theory, and I borrowed that from Bob Williams, who analyzes systems in that way. Uh, everybody is not a game maker or a game designer. So the game designer might be conscious of creating a racist system, whereas the advocate 
probably becomes unconscious, they buy into the system that was created by the designer. And so the advocate is a racist in the sense that I'm talking about it, or the dealer, you know, those people who carry out the rules of the master in the system without really knowing why the master created the system, or even that a system was created. They just simply inherit a belief system and, a, and a, an action system. And in that sense, they are the they are players in the game, but they are not the game makers. So okay. I make a distinction. Now, now break those. that down for for the person on the street one time. Right. Go, go, go over that again. <laughs> so there, go over there, that there, again. There are some people who are puppets. All right. And there are others who are puppeteers. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Free your mind. I'll try to do a better job. Free. <laughs> okay. Free your mind. Return to the source. African origins. Why that title? Okay, well, obviously, we've been talking about um, the, the fact that the adjustment to domination is, is, is kind of a, a mental adjustment as well as uh, a physical adjustment. So for the person who is enslaved and for the person who enslaves, I've already suggested that there is a distortion between the real world and what they believe. There's a mismatch between those two things. So what we need to do in order to get back at the truth is to um, have mental freedom. So I like to title this a program about mental freedom. So it's free your mind. Return to the source suggests the way to get to mental freedom. That means going back to primary sources. Uh, instead of talking about what someone heard, let's go to the evidence itself. Uh, also, in the case of African people, it means returning to African sources because that's the only way that renewal can occur. And then, of course, African origins refers to the fact that uh, uh, Africa is the home of many things, and most of us don't know that. And it's and it's been um, it, things have been said about Africa that make us believe the opposite of that. We don't believe that Africa was a creative place that it was a teacher. We believe that Africa was always a recipient, a student of other people. And so African origins, uh, which is the source, one of the sources, by considering those African origins, it's a way to free the mind of oppressor and oppressed. I have a short section that I call the defamation of African people. And the reason that I do this is that the, um, it's important to establish the fact uh, that um, some of the things I said are true, and I, uh, we won't have time to go into many of these, but I'll just show you okay. an example of uh, the perceptual distortion, the denial of reality, uh, the attempt to erase history, the attempt to oppress culture. All right. Uh, in 1910, uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica had an article in it about Negro. Mm -hmm. This would be one of many examples of how African and other people get information about themselves. And here's an example. I actually took a photograph of that article. And uh, if you'll notice in the second underlying paragraph on that article, it says, mentally, the Negro is inferior to the white. Mm -hmm. Then it goes on in that article to talk about the fact that as children, our children were OK. They were bright, uh, smart, well-developed but that as black children and white children grow older, black children become dumb and white children become smart. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you have to think of black and white people and as being different people. This is in the Encyclopedia Britannica. This is in the most respected encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica. So the most authoritative thought then would have sanctioned this view in 1910. And that was not unlike what was being said in theological schools, which were teaching that Africans did not have souls, uh, that would be taught in certain biology classes, which were teaching that Africans were not even a part of the same branch of the human family, uh, that would have been taught in history classes, which taught that Africans had no history, and so forth and so on. In other words, that whole um, uh, body of thought uh, that emerged during uh, the periods of uh, the past couple hundred years to create uh, the orientation among Europeans that would allow them to oppress African people without feeling bad about it. So what does this say about the role white scholarship played and continues to play in the oppression of black people? Um, in general, uh, European scholarship has been leading 
in the creation of the belief system. In fact, I think it would be safe to say that without the scholars, there would have been no racism because they helped create the belief system with authenticity. If a professor of biology says uh, that Africans are inferior, if a scholars, there would have been no racism because they helped create the belief system with authenticity. If a professor of biology says uh, that Africans are inferior, if a professor of theology says it, it's different than having a man on the street say it. So we can actually, in tracing the history of racism, in other words, we don't have to speculate about this, there are many good books on the history of racism uh, led by scholars in academic institutions. A good example would be the book by Alan Chase called The Legacy of Malthus. Uh, and there are many others, The Leopard Spots by Stanton. Uh, there are many books that study the seminal role that scholars have played in creating these images of uh, Africans. Once again, why did the slave master attempt to de-Africanize the African? Well, it's very important. Uh, anyone who studies the function of culture, what culture does for a group of people, knows that culture glues a group of people together so that you have group unity. So that in the slave ma for the slave master to be successful, he had to destroy group unity. And the best way that he could destroy group unity was to destroy that which held the group together, which was the group's own identity, way of life, uh, historical memory, or, in short, to destroy the group's culture. Why should a people 400 years physically removed from Africa be concerned about their Africanness? Uh, for the same reason that uh, I was uh, trying to explain in terms of why the slave master uh, chose to attack the culture of the slave. If the slave is to be liberated, the slave must affirm that culture, must go back, recapture, uh, incorporate, use their own native cultural form as the base for creating a brand new life. Well, you know what Malcolm X, he quoted somebody one time saying, you know, I didn't leave anything Af in, a in Africa. You know, I'm not an African. That's true. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said, uh, he said uh, you say I haven't left anything in Africa. Mm -hmm. He says, why, you left your mind in Africa, <laughs> <laughs> which is true. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a look then at the next example would be a page out of a catalog uh, called Johnson Catalog where... Uh, white actors, minstrels, could get something that was called nigger makeup. And uh, the, uh, this was circulated all over the country. And for years, actually for almost 50 years, one of the most popular forms in entertainment in America was this minstrel. Uh, so here is a white actor, in this case Al Jolson, and we need to see the whole slide. Okay. Uh, Al Jolson, who is... Um, uh, was, became very famous doing imitations of imitation black people because these were not real black people. But you'll notice that he has burnt cork on his face and he's done something to his hair. And uh, then he becomes comic and that gives him the opportunity to project an image of African people to other people. And uh, so this is another example of the defamation of African people. Here's a contemporary example. This is a uh, darky toothpaste that's sold by Colgate uh, uh, Palmolive uh, Company. It's sold in the Far East. And uh, again, the, uh, the exaggeration of black facial features, uh, the, uh, the business of uh, ridicule and so forth, making fun of uh, black people, uh, you see that happening right now. And, uh, in fact, there's an article in the Atlanta Constitution uh, showing the reaction of some groups to the fact that uh, Colgate Palmolive Company uh, sold this stuff in the Far East. When they were asked about it, mm -hmm. according to this news article, uh, they what said... Year? Uh, this would have been, I think, it's 1986, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, they, would have, they said, when asked about this, well... Uh, there's no black people over here anyway to see this, and it's not offensive to others, so we're going to go ahead and sell it. So uh, the last word I had is still being sold. Mm -hmm. James Baldwin mm -hmm. has said that many times 
what you say about someone else says more about you than about that person. With this in mind, what was the commentary that whites were making about themselves when they blackened their faces? Well, you know, there's a, there's a real interesting book called Blacking Up. And uh, it's a, it really examines the psychology of white people who blacked up. Blacked up, blacking up means putting on the uh, burnt cork and, and doing minstrels. At one level, you could say it's, it's creating entertainment and making fun of black people. But what this book talks about from firsthand interviews with people who used to do that was they actually had an identification with the black uh, culture, sometimes with black people. And one person said they just didn't feel right until they got blacked up. They'd lay down at night and dream about blacking up. They'd have this in their dreams for days and days on end. And until they could actually get blacked up and begin to do the things that they thought black people did. Oh, no. Are there strong Freudian implications for this or what? If I were a Freudian psychologist, <laughs> I'd give you a Freudian <laughs> explanation for uh -huh. it. But uh, clearly it's something that needs to be studied as as um, as as a behavioral phenomenon, you know the uh, the idea uh, of the psychological meaning that this has for whites, other than just simply making fun of black people. Some people treat it as just being mean, but there's much more to it than that. Okay. 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 Let's. Uh, here's another example. There are a few more. I'll just run through these because there. Uh, interest is in some other things, but this is this is an example of postcards that used to be sent through the United States Mail. I have hundreds of these. Uh, this says, a coon trees a possum in Dixie. Uh, so it's making fun of the uh, black male. Uh, polio. This is uh, the use of the watermelon as a stereotype uh, with a black face in it. And this was an advertisement for soap. And this is happening around what period? In, in well, it happened up, and it's still happening, quite frankly, mm -hmm. but uh, you'd see most of these in the uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, in the 50s, and even into the 60s. You'd see a lot of advertisements like these. Mm -hmm. um, even now, you still see sold in stores the little man who holds the lantern outside uh, for your lawn, you know, a little black figure who holds the, the lantern as a servant. Uh, this was a textbook that was used in uh, the late 1800s. Uh, Ten Little Niggers, actually used in schools as a textbook. In this country? In this country, yes. Um, it would be interesting to go through the pages of this textbook and see the stories because they're even more objectionable than the title uh, suggests, but we just don't have time to get into it. But again, if, if, if African-American children have to rely on these images for understanding about who they are and where they have come from, then you can see that we are putting into the African-American mind information that will distort reality. So all of these images were designed to do what? To uh, defame black people, to, as you say, de-Africanize black people, uh, to turn the African into something other than an African. Okay. For the purposes that we talked about a little earlier, to destroy the cultural base in order to destroy the political unity of the group. Okay. Okay, uh, the question was asked in a, a magazine article some time ago, the television, because now we want, you know, you were asking earlier, how long ago was this? And I indicated that these things continue to happen even in uh, 1987. Uh, does television have a secret formula for blacks? And we see the Jeffersons as one of the most popular programs on TV. Uh, and this, this is the picture that talks about what that formula is. It appears that on American television, virtually all of the programming that is done about black people is program, programming that is written by white people. <laughs> You know, there are very few exceptions to this. And, and these, are some of, these are some of the authors of those programs, like the Jeffersons, like Fred Sanford and Son, and so forth. So what we have in black images on television is white people's images of what black people are or perhaps ought to be. Which is a continuation of the minstrels. Which is a continuation of the minstrel. And so we'll see it. Let's see what kind of images they like. Uh, they like images like this. 
uh, Fred Sanford, mm -hmm. uh, like this. JJ, you remember how long, uh, how prominent JJ was? I think was. he's back on television. Is, is he back on? He's back okay. on. He has a family now, I think. <laughs> he has a, okay. <laughs> but he's doing the same thing. Oh, uh -huh. probably. Mm -hmm. Let's look at uh, uh, what happens as a consequence of that over time. Then African American children, looking at the negative images of African people that are shown, cannot develop positive images of themselves. So then they seek images uh, that are positive by looking at other people besides themselves. Okay. 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 Uh, that was just a brief introduction. We could have done hours just right. on that part alone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and there's really a need to go into that kind of thing much more in detail. But this is the part that you want to get to. This is the part that I want to get to. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, but my wife told me that I had to put that other part <laughs> in, so people wouldn't know why it was necessary for okay. me to go into that right. part. Okay. Uh, the uh, the next section uh, is a section that we call Africa as the Cradle of Humanity. And uh, there's a need to talk about this because until recently, there's been very little acknowledgement of the fact that the human family was a, was a single human family. You know, a few years ago, 100 years or so ago, there were many theories about the fact that, uh, uh, that human beings actually started separately in different places on the earth, that there, black people started in Africa, white people started in Europe, yellow people started in Asia. Polycentric. Polycentric, theory. polygenetic theory. Mm -hmm. Many, many origins uh -huh. for human beings. Well, uh, I think that's been pretty thoroughly discredited now. And as they began to search for what was called a monogenetic origin, or a single uh, origin for all people, that there's really only one human family, and that's what I think almost everybody believes right now. That as they began to search for this one source of the human family, uh, the chauvinism of the people who were doing the searching at the time, those who were searching were European, so they wanted this human family to originate in Europe, or they wanted its fullest development to be European. So they began to search in Europe for ancient fossil finds, ancient bones, never uh, really were able to go back very far. In fact, as far as they were ever able to go back was about 500,000 years. Uh, then the search for this human ancestor shifted to Asia, and uh, it was very intensive. Uh, the search could only go back to about a million years. And then this search shifted to Africa. They were looking in all these places at the same time, but they really wanted to find the oldest bones in Europe, and if not Europe, then Asia, and finally in Africa. And of course, Africa is now recognized by virtually everyone as the home of the human family. And it starts back about five million years ago. And Africa is not only the home of all the human types. There are six different human types that have been on the earth. And Africa is the home of all six of those types. And the earliest form of each of those types is found on the continent of Africa. But once again, why were European scholars so bent on making Europe the, the place of origin of humanity? Uh, they would be what you call Eurocentric. In other words, they wanted to elevate Europe to claim all good things for Europe. And at that time, the origin of man uh, being in Europe could have been considered uh, support for the theory of white supremacy or European supremacy. Now, what time are we talking? What time period are we talking about? We're talking this about the uh, 1600s, 1700s, mm -hmm. 1800s during that period, but especially during the last 200 years. Okay, the um, National Geographic magazine uh, is, um, I guess, in, in 1985, November of 1985. That's when this particular w issue was uh, was presented contains the summary of the information that I was just giving you, and I will go through it very quickly. Uh, today, Africa is recognized as the cradle of the human race. That's one line out of that article on early man in, in National Geographic. Uh, skin color was probably dark, an evolutionary adaptation to the tropical sun. And what is that? Why was mm -hmm. skin color dark? Well, biologists have uh, a rule, uh, an explanation, that says that warm-blooded animals, like human beings, when they live in tropical climates, 
in humid tropical climates uh, develop uh, pigmentation. Uh, they have uh, a chemical called eumelanin, which is responsible, among other things, for skin color. And uh, that dark skin color in the tropics protects you from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. So anyone who was not protected in that way generally wouldn't survive. For example, albinos can survive to a normal life in northern Europe. A normal life, you know, there's really very little threat to their lives. But in the tropics, very few live beyond the age of 30. Mm -hmm. So uh, th because of the ultraviolet rays of the sun being damaging to people with that pigmentation, and until we had air conditioning and other forms of adjustment, it wasn't easy for populations not native to Africa to survive in Africa. But in, so that if you were guessing what the early African looked like, as, as uh, people who studied that do now, uh, the archaeologists, paleontologists, biologists who are interested in ancient human beings, their, their best guess is that these ancient human beings had to be black people, just as the uh, people of Africa today are. Okay. Okay. Okay, here is uh, one of the human types. Remember I said there were six human types. There were two different types of Australopithecines, Australopithecus ro uh, gracile, Australopithecus robustus, uh, Australopithecus, I'm sorry, Homo habilis. Mm -hmm. uh, and these three types that I've shown so far are found only on the continent of Africa. Nowhere else do they exist. Then we have the first one to leave the continent of Africa was Homo erectus, the one that I'm showing you now. Homo erectus left the continent of Africa uh, approximately a million years ago. And we call this one Pithecanthropus erectus, if you've heard, <laughs> <laughs> heard, uh, heard him talked about in school. Uh -huh. uh, then there is Neanderthal. Uh, this one apparently left the continent of Africa somewhere around 500,000 years ago. But the oldest bones for Neanderthal are found on the African continent. Uh, this one is called Homo sapiens sapiens. This is the only one that's left out of the six, and that's modern man. And so... Who originated in... Who also originated in Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some new information on modern man. For years, uh, the best estimate as to how old modern man was in Africa was that modern man was approximately uh, 100,000 years old in Africa. Uh, it turns out now that there are some um, uh, people who are doing studies of mitochondrial DNA, uh, which is uh, genetic information in the human cell. And it turns out that there's two different types of DNA information uh, uh, generators. In one is in the middle of the cell or the nucleus of the cell. The other is in the tissue of the cell. That DNA that's in the tissue of the cell is carried only by the female. Uh, that allows uh, scientists to study uh, the evolution of different groups. And without going into all the technical details, which I don't understand, mm -hmm. uh, and it is necessary at this point, it is important to point out that in three different parts of the world, in London, I think it was at Oxford, at Emory University in Georgia, Atlanta, at Berkeley, California, at these three universities, uh, independently these scientists have studied through computer modeling, uh, backwards in time, uh, the origin of the human family. And they come up with a woman they call African Eve. And instead of 100,000 years old, this woman is 250,000 years old. That's the estimate. And it turns out that in their theory, one African woman is responsible, or at least is the direct ancestor, of every human being on the face of the earth. Everybody who now lives traces their ancestry back to this one African woman. And the speculation about how she looked is that she would look like a person that we call the Australian bush people. I mean, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, South African bushmen in the Kalahari, in the Kalahari region. Not the Australian, but the, the, in Southern Africa, in the Kalahari region, you have the so-called bush people. And that these people have the genetic uh, material that is diversified enough to have been the unit that became the parent group for everybody else in the so world. So once again, this woman would have been how old now? Uh, 250,000 years old. And now, just uh -huh. by way of comparison, 
The oldest Homo sapiens sapiens bones that we find in Europe are 50,000, about 40,000 to 50,000 years old. This is the Grimaldi skeletons that were found yeah. in the Grimaldi cave. So you have the African, how long ago now? You have the African at least 200,000 years before they, they moved to the okay. European continent. And the European comes on the scene when? Well, the African comes on the scene in Europe mm -hmm. approximately 50,000 years ago. In okay. other words, the first European was an African too, and it's mm -hmm. still an African, and, and an African who has changed. And, and uh, once again, what, what happened to that African once he got to, to Europe? Well, you had, uh, you had several ice ages that, and, and a change in environment, and the theory is that the um, uh, change in environment, and especially the, the ice age part of it, being cut off from the African continent, having a completely different environment with respect to diet and climate and all those things, uh, resulted over a 20,000 year period in physical changes, uh, genetic mutations to adapt to that particular in in environment. And about 20,000, about 20,000 years or so ago, we have uh, um, changes sufficient that we, we, we look and see distinct people when they really aren't distinct in that sense, in the sense of having um, uh, groups that can't interbreed, that, that's what one of the biological definitions of race is, mm -hmm. that groups can't, you know, a dog and a cow can't have offspring, so mm -hmm. they would be mm -hmm. different things. But varieties of the same family, so that the European that resulted was merely a depigmented African. Okay, let's go on. Okay. Okay, uh, if you notice, all these fossils that I was talking about, and this is just a sample of some of them, are located in Africa, mainly in the same place. You know, they, they all are located with their center around Lake Victoria or Lake Nyanza. And so you'll see that they're in Ethiopia, they're in Tanzania, they're in Uganda, uh, uh, down in Mozambique, and so forth. These are the places, but mostly in Kenya and uh, Tanzania. These are the richest fossil finds. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm trying to show that they're tightly packed together in one place, and that's all of the types are generally, they would generally, you would say that they had their home in the equatorial region of Africa. And then later, they moved northward down the Nile Valley. Remember, the Nile is about 4,000 miles long. And so that was literally a highway down which these populations over various times migrated. At least three of them migrated far enough to leave the African continent. Okay. Uh, okay, so far what we've talked about is the defamation of African people and examples of that. Then we've talked about the origin of the human family, which brings us to really what is the most important part, because early man, uh, oh, let's say uh, early man and modern man being found in Africa by itself has very little meaning for most of the things that we're concerned about, which has to do with what some people call civilized behavior. So what we want to know, though, is when did human beings begin to develop high civilization? And who were these human beings that did that? Uh, it turns out that Africans were, according to the records that we have now, the ones who first developed the elements of high civilization. And that's what we'd like to look at right okay. now, which is the story of high civilization in the world, which is also the beginning of civilization on the African continent. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me come, before we go to that particular okay, slide. Go to the card here? Yeah, let me go to the card, and okay. I'd like to uh, explain what we'll be talking about over the next few minutes. Uh, this is a time chart of that period of the development of recorded civilization. What this means is that something was happening before 4000 B.C. We're going to pick up the story right around in here. But even before 4000 B.C., according to ancient African oral records, things were going on as far as 25,000 B.C. They say that the age of one of their nations goes back that far. But we're just going to confine ourselves to the records that exist and not merely to oral testimony. And so to do that, we're going to look at a timeline that starts back here, let's say around 4000 BC, comes all the way up to the present. And let's see what was happening in the world and put some things that we know next to okay. some things that we may not know about. 
Uh, this side is Africa, and this side is Asia and Europe. Okay? In Africa, the oldest nation that we find, and also in the world, because there are no nations over here that are this old, the oldest nation in the, in, in the world is, is in Taseti, or was named Taseti, Land of the Bow. And it's located in Nubia, under the waters of the Aswan Dam. Now, this Taseti is, is covered. Uh, when, UNESCO, when, you, uh, when they built the Aswan Dam, United Nations Educational and Cultural Organization, with the cooperation of the United States and several other nations, rescued uh, uh, the artifacts by digging in the graves and everything and pulled up bodies and pottery and, and what have you, enabling us to discover that long before Egypt or Kemet, long before Kemet, which starts as a nation here, long before Kemet, you had another nation, Nubia, which is the parent of Kemet. So that 3500 BC to about uh, 3100 BC, you had Kemet in operation. And the physical description of the, of the kings of Taseti, mm -hmm. the physical description of them, is that they are tall and that they have Negroid appearance. Their bodies were found. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were located in Nubia, which has always been the home of uh, black African populations. And the Nubians still exist? Nubians still exist. Would you describe them for us? Uh, you, you one were of in, the, in, in Egypt uh, recently. Uh, probably the darkest people in Africa are Nubians, anywhere on the continent. Even when you go down into southern Africa, uh, they become more brown skinned. But wh when you get to that part of Kenya uh, and parts of Ethiopia, but especially in Nubia, you have a very, very dark uh, population. And they created what now? This is Taseti. Uh -huh. Everything, all the evidence shows that that was the population which, which of Taseti. Which is older than Which than is Egypt. older than Egypt. Okay, go ahead. Okay, now we have Egypt, 3100 BC, and we have 12 dynasties. Th these are 12 families. We have it grouped this way for a very special reason. That was the first nation that most people knew about in the world. And for the first 1,000 years of Kemetic existence, uh, or Egyptian, or Egyptian e existence, mm -hmm. that, so Kemet is Egypt, mm -hmm. except that the old uh, Egyptians never called them their country Egypt. They called it Kemet. So we call it Kemet to refer to the old civilization. So if you say Egypt, you're really talking about the new uh, civilization, which is mainly Arabic, okay. which is a foreign population, just like the European population is in America now. But they weren't here 10,000 years ago. The people who are in Egypt now are? They're, they're, they are people who came from Syria, Assyria, even Persia and places like that, and mixed with Nubian populations. So they're mainly a foreign population. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the 12 families, 1 through 12, go from 3100 B.C. up to about 2000 B.C. What's important about that is all the pyramids were built during that period. All the major pyramids were built during that period, and no invaders had conquered an African country in, in, in the record. There's no record of invaders having conquered Africa from outside, which means that all the pyramids were built by native Africans, and most of the main pyramids were built at the first part of the, this family, in what we call the Old Kingdom, dynasties 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's when most of your pyramids were built. So that when you get down here to Dynasty 11 and 12, which is the Middle Kingdom, see, this would be Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom. Th this is when you read Egyptian history. Now, when you say pyramid, some people might not have mm -hmm. an appreciation right. for that structure. You're talking about a structure that's 48 stories high. You're talking, yes, you're talking about the Great Pyramid. And that uh -huh. was one of the first pyramids, by the way. Uh -huh. The pyramids got worse as they got, as they began to build more of them, they did a poorer job. Okay. But uh, the first pyramid was a step pyramid, and then there were a couple of pyramids by the uh, founder of the uh, fourth dynasty, Seneferu, whose picture we will show. Okay. Uh, and his son, Khufu, built the Great Pyramid. Now, that pyramid is the 48-story building. Okay. And, uh, and that's 2200 BC, BC or so, it, right? It, it would be, right. It would be around 2200 BC. Okay. It's built out of 2 million limestone blocks, 2 million 200,000 to be more precise. And each one of those blocks weighs about 2 tons apiece. 
and uh, it's still standing. It's one of the only wonders of the world that you can still go back and, and okay. see today. So what's important is that the pyramid age, the high-tech age, a technological age, which showed that Africans could, were architects, engineers, astronomers, and so forth, occurs here, and you have nothing like it anywhere else in the world going on, only on the African continent. And then we have an invasion here. Now, where is Europe during this time? I mean, where is, uh, there is, no Europe where is Greece? During this time. There is no Greece during this time. You will not get a Greece until approximately at this point. In fact, you don't have now, When Greece. you say there is no Europe, you don't mean that land doesn't exist. The land exists, but right. what I'm saying is you don't have organized nations okay. on the human record. There are no okay. records of nations at that time. You have people there, right. and you have land there, but you have no organized nations. So what we call Europe as a concept is either a continental civilization or a nation or a national or a series of nations that did not exist as an idea or during a, during this period pyramid of the pyramid age okay. did not exist. Okay. We'll begin to say something about Europe over here. Um, let's look at um, the invasion though. This is the first invasion from Asia. Uh, that invasion was a very destructive invasion. In other words, they they, they, they brought nothing other than the horse and the chariot. Okay. That's the only uh, innovation that historians... And this is around what time? This would be shortly after 2000 B.C., about okay. 1700 B.C. or okay. so. This group, the Hyksos, came in, and they stayed there for a while, about 150 years or so. Um, Abraham came in about that time. Now, this is not to say that Abraham was a Hykso. We don't know who Abraham mm -hmm. was. But in the Bible, according to oral history, Abraham came in around 1750 B.C., which would have been about the time of this invasion, from Ur of the Chaldees. Moses then leaves about 1300 B.C. Again, we don't know because all of this is oral history. And, uh, but these two overlap this invading period, which disrupts the continuity of Kemet. Kemet comes back. Egypt. Egypt, Egypt comes back in this grand and glorious dynasty. This would be the great golden age. See, there was a golden age in the pyramid age. There's a golden age in the middle kingdom. And this is the grand golden age right here. This is the King Tut, Nefertiti, Nefertari dynasty. After the invaders were kicked out. After the invaders were kicked out. And we will see who kicked the invaders out. And uh, then we had a growth program again. In other words, what we're trying to, what I'm trying to say is that all of the high-tech periods were led by natives. Okay. In other words, you have nothing left of what these people did. Okay. Then there's also a 19th dynasty. This is the Ramses period. I'm not going to talk about that. Okay. we got about 10 minutes, I think. 10 Go minutes? Ahead. Is that all? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so the 25th you know. dynasty, <laughs> which is the revival age. These are, all, but these are important golden ages of native black African rule. That's why I have them posted there. It's also important to notice that we have the first uh, intrusion of Greeks into Africa here. This, is, this uh, is the period of Alexander the Great through the Ptolemies, and then uh, the Roman period starts just before Christ and comes up to here. So you have a 300-year period here of Greek rule, about a 300-year period of Roman rule. This is 600 years of foreign rule of Kemet. And so I'm putting this up because later when I show you a couple pictures of Greeks and Romans, we want you to see where they come into mm -hmm. uh, Egyptian history. And they come in during what period? They come in just around the time of Christ. And, okay. and they, they come in at the end of uh, the period. In other words, they contribute literally nothing, but they take a lot out. Okay. This, so this is why we say the foundation of Greco-Roman civilization culturally is an African foundation. They took what they learned here, home, and began to imitate those cultural okay. forms. Actually, the contact between Greece and Rome and Africa begins here when Africans went to Greece and Rome. Especially say that, say the that again now. Say that again. Africans in uh, uh, the, this kingdom here, the 12th dynasty around 2000 B.C., Africans were in what we call Greece. In fact, one of the people I will show you on the 
Slides is supposed to be the founder of Athens, according to Greek mythology, not according to African mythology, but mm -hmm. I mean also according to Af African mythology. But this is what the Greeks said but about. But the Greeks said origin. that their founder, mm -hmm. you know, was out, came from outside, mm -hmm. especially Athens, Athens, which is very important. Uh -huh. So I, I hope that this uh, timeline will help us to uh, place the pictures of the royal images in some kind of order as we go through those. Okay, things. let's. Let me ask you to go through it one more time right. in our remaining minutes. Just, just briefly go over that again. Okay, so you start with uh, the first nation in human history, Tasseti. Uh, you follow Tasseti. You go a little bit north on the continent to a place we now call Egypt. It's called Kemet for 12 families and then an interruption from Asia. Some more families in the 18th dynasty. And then there's a period of kind of general decline. Another revival here in the 25th dynasty, sometimes called the Ethiopian dynasty. And then the Persians come in here, some more deterioration. Finally, the important period that we know most about Egypt from is the Greco-Roman period here, around the time of Christ. And that marks the end of political control of Kemet by native Africans. And okay. it meant that outsiders will, from there on, outsiders will control Kemet. The culture stays the same through the whole 3,000-year period. Okay. Any last comments before you, final comments before we Before we break, you out. might say, you might say here, here is also, in, in, when these people lost out, some of them moved south, and we have a 600-year period of rule by African queens at the same time that the Greeks and Romans were ruling the north part of the continent. These queens ruled from Miro up near uh, Khartoum in what is now Sudan. And there's a whole story to be told about them that we just will not have time to get into. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll come back. Thank you.